Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Scarborough Town Council Wednesday, July 13, 2016 workshop with Avesta Housing. Uh, and it is 6.33, so we're a couple minutes late, and I'm going to ask uh, Tom Hall to introduce this. Great. I'll give uh, just a couple of words of introduction. We do have Seth Parker here from Avesta Housing and Jay Chase from the planning offices here as well if, if we need his services. Uh, but I think this council should uh, recall and, and is well familiar with this project. I think from my estimate, uh, every time it came before the council, it was met with uh, great interest and in, in UNM's support. And really because it met two of our uh, uh, policy objectives for last year, which was historic preservation and affordable housing. It's kind of a, a dual purpose. Uh, what's happened in the inter intervening months is that um, you may recall that this project, like all other affordable housing projects, really require a heavy subsidy to make them work. And in this case, federal tax credits are the, the source of that subsidy, if you will. Uh, there's an <coughs> annual cycle that happens in the fall of the year. And unfortunately, this project didn't get funded last year. It was a very competitive process. And so through the winter months, uh, Main State Housing came out with some proposed revisions to the process they use to select projects for funding. And through that process, it was determined that the way this project was uh, put together in terms of the type of units, uh, it would be a struggle to get a score well and get funding going forward. So with that, Seth and his, uh, his folks uh, decided to kind of uh, retool the project. The footprint stays the same. Uh, but kind of the mix and the type of the housing units changes really for the purposes of uh, scoring better and obtaining those federal tax credits. I guess the last piece I'll just share with you, you may recall there was a contract zone, there is a contract zone that permits this project to happen. Uh, and there's also a TIF in place that uh, also is uh, very important for its funding. Uh, we've reviewed these changes with the town attorney. And in both cases, there's no formal amendment to either document or agreement that's required. But given your interest and involvement, we thought it would be helpful to apprise you of these changes and certainly the public. So with that, I, uh, I think it'd be best if Seth would give us an overview, perhaps? Sure. Sure. Um, Tom's actually done a lot of the explanation. Um, and so, uh, so I'm, just as introduction, I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Avesta Housing. And um, as such, I'm sort of responsible for um, trying to um, interpret the new rule that Maine Housing puts out every year um, for under which we compete for our, our low-income housing tax credit. <coughs> and it's, it's not unusual for them to, um, to tweak, tweak their policy initiatives, um, change course a little bit. It's a, a big ship, so we usually don't like them to try to change course too abruptly because there's a lot of folks like us out there that are, you know, that have investments in projects. Um, you know, we have significant dollars invested in this project, and if we, for some reason, like last year, um, through a so sort of a, a small, um, a small sort of, sort of almost technical technical miss on the application, don't get the tax credits, um, you know, we will obviously look to come back the ensuing year to with the same project. So in this case, Main Housing made a slight, um, they sort of made some policy changes and, and they're trying to incentivize, um, it, it's almost a little bit reactionary. As a reaction to the, the past QAP, they were, they were seeing that there was a lot of, a lot of smaller units that were being built. Um, and that was sort of a reaction to their their focus on cost and controlling cost per unit. So in this time, <coughs> they they kept the cost per unit um, piece in place, but they also wanted to try to in, try to incentivize within that developers to build some family units and communities because they were hearing they were hearing from I think loud and clear from a lot of municipalities that um, there was a need for family housing. And so um, we looked at that looked at those changes and felt that. Uh, in order to keep this project competitive, that we did think that it warranted um, changing the unit mix to more family units, some more two-bedroom and three-bedroom units. And you know, from a market perspective, um, it, to us, 
it's it's immaterial. We, we feel that I mean, there's, it, you know, you just can't build enough affordable housing from our perspective. And whether it be um, more smaller units or 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 more family units, they're all needed equally. So from our perspective, it just did this didn't cause us any pause. It was mostly just trying to figure out whether there was a way to do this um, within the existing footprint of the building. Um, and so essentially trying to not to not to alter the site plan um, and just try to essentially move walls within the building <coughs> and create a different unit mix. And we, we found a, a pretty good solution for that that meets main housing's new criteria. And so the result of that was last year, uh, we, have, we had the project approved at, at 50 units, and that consisted of eight efficiencies, 37 one-bedrooms, and five two-bedroom apartments. And as a result of this year's QAP, um, we felt that we needed to change that, and um, the result was we, we, are now, um, we are now designing <coughs> this so that it would have four efficiencies, 14 one bedrooms, 12 two bedrooms, and eight three bedroom units. So essentially, there's, you know, we're taking many of those, we're, we're, we're taking a few less studios, and we're taking many of those one bedrooms and converting them to two and three bedroom units for, for a total, <coughs> total of 38 units. Um, other than that, the you know the approach, the site, you know the site plan all stays the same. The you know the historic restoration of the existing Southgate farmhouse um, would be the same approach in that instance as well. I don't know if I missed any particular details, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. So um, only because it's a, so the math doesn't add up to the numbers. There's eight units missing. Yeah, the fifty. So, and we just noticed another clerical error. I apologize for that. I caught one, I caught the, the bottom one, but I didn't catch this one. So, it says eight studios and it says 29 what bed, one bedrooms. That should be 37, 37 one bedrooms. Okay. Um, I think what happened was inadvertently we forgot about the eight one bedrooms in the existing house, as Jay actually just pointed out to me a few minutes ago. So, good and though. Tom as well. Chris, uh, so two questions. Um, First thing is, what is this going to do to the economic impact? You got um, obviously your payback now is going to be a little different because you got 38 units instead of 50. Is it going to have a big impact on the cost per unit? So the cost, you know, the, you know, getting into the weeds of, of how we look at it a little bit, the cost per unit goes up, um, but we would also gain points in a category that they've created, incentivizing senior housing. So. We're gaining some points by building senior units, and we would we would sort of <coughs> we would sort of look at it to lose a few points in the cost per unit category. But those gain points in the family housing are important enough and enough to offset what we're losing in our cost per unit category. And so on net, we we feel that it's actually it it scores a little better than it, it's going to be hard to tell right out of the gate because you know when they create these new scoring categories, it's a little hard it's a little hard to tell how other projects fit into that, but we well, think on net it, it still scores as competitively or, or, or better. What will that do to the, to the rents though? I mean, if you get more units, obviously your rents can be a little bit lower, right? Or, or the rents fixed and that's just your payback period. So, you know, that's, that gets into the underwriting. You know, I mean, if you look at, you know, if you look at the, the rent schedule um, with the, by, by nature, as it's a, it's a good point, the, the revenue is a little less in this instance. Um, you know, so the gross revenue, because there's less units and because, you know, the, the, the increased rent for the bigger units mm -hmm. doesn't offset the lesser amount of units. Mm -hmm. Yes, on net, our, our gross revenue is lower, but, you know, we, we, have to, we just have to offset that with, um, you know, what that can mean is it supports a little less debt and we just have to find other sources to fill that gap. And, and um, from, from that approach, we're comfortable with it, that it's still a feasible project budget. Okay. And all, all the tenants are income qualified, right? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they're going to be within we're all between defined 40 mandate. and 60% of area right. in income. Sure, and those rents, um, you know, I think we spoke about the rents last year for the smaller units. Um, and so just to refresh, you know the the student. We'll start from the top, from the bigger units. 
um, the three bedroom rents, which we didn't have last year, are between, depending on, you know, there's three tranches of income levels here that, that, that these will serve residents at. And so the, the range in rent for the three bedrooms is between $800 to $1,200 for a three bedroom apartment. And that, again, the range in the two bedroom apartments is between 700 to roughly 1,000, a little over 1,000. And the one bedrooms are 580 to 870. And the studios are between um, $540 a month to $810 a month. Peter. Yeah, a couple quick questions. Um, last year when this was presented, I felt fairly comfortable with it based on what it was. And I, and I understand the difference between last year and this year. It sounds like that's you know how you qualify for the credits. A couple of questions I have is one, do we know what the town actually needs? And they start off by saying last year I was pretty comfortable and actually Bill and I attended something today. Whereas tax rates go up in Scarborough, there's more and more of our senior citizens that are feeling like they can't afford to stay in their homes that they own, but would like to stay in Scarborough. So I was feeling with the single units and the studio that that, that was at least some way to give them a viable option. This is really predominantly weighted now toward families. I mean, it's a dramatic change. So one, do we, and I guess this is a question for both the town and Avista, do we know what the town actually needs for housing? What's, what's the biggest demand? What's the biggest demand for units? And the second question I have, with a two bedroom and three bedroom, that has a much different demand on town services, I'd imagine. I mean, education being a big piece of that. I mean, I'm assuming that means, and don't know if you have any estimates of how many additional students usually will be in these units, but I think I would like, before we go much further, I'd love to have some kind of impact study about what, what the cost difference is to the town and resources for these two models. I think it's pretty dramatic. Sure. Um, so just taking the last piece first, I, I mean, I would ask, I, mean, I, I sort of went through this in anticipation that, that that question might come up on how many, how many children might live um, at, at this property with this unit mix. And I estimated that um, roughly what our data suggests that roughly 50 to 60 percent of the two bedroom units might might have someone with it with it with a child living there mm -hmm. and so if you take the 12 two bedroom units I said that the that in all likelihood you'd have seven seven kids in those units and then in the three bedroom units it's it's usually you know 100 percent of those units would have a family living in those and so on average, plus or minus, if you have two children living in in those eight three bedroom units, that'd be that'd be 16 kids. So I, th I think you know in in rough numbers, <coughs> I would anticipate that there'd be families living at this property, and there'd be on the order of 20, 23 children living there. But it also has traffic implications, and other things too. I mean, I just know I, I have a I have a freshman in high school. I'm on the road three times a day just with him for his service. I mean, the things that he's doing, he's going to work, he's going to driver's ed, all that stuff. So I mean, I, that for us, I just think, it's, at least for me, I just like to understand the impact of these different models. I think it and I think Jay and I are going to talk about this a little bit in terms of traffic impact. If we need to just get some updated feedback back from our, for our traffic consultant, we can do that. My initial sense is that um, we have, we'll, we'll have less units um, here, and I would not anticipate that we would actually have more cars, even though their family is living there. Our 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 um, experience is that you, that m most of the families that that live in our family units still have one car. Mm -hmm. um, and I can get some data. I'd be happy to get some data surrounding that. It, it, it's not as much the number of cars; it's the number of trips in and out of those intersections. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and the first question I just love is, do we know what Scarborough has the highest demand for or need for as for affordable housing, whether it's so singles or... I don't know that I have specific data, um, maybe someone else here does, that, they're, that they know of. I, I do know that, la that last year when we were going through the planning board process, that I, I do specifically remember that there was some commentary that that people that people felt that there was a need for family units in Scarborough and would mm -hmm. would, would like to see that. Um, I know from from our sense we, we see a need for that. Um, 
certainly, I don't know specific to Scarborough, but in the in the greater Portland area, absolutely there's a need for, for family housing. Uh, I can speak to that point to, to some extent. Will, then Jim. So uh, we did, Scarborough did do a study as a town about uh, 2005, 2006. Um, it is available online. It's definitely dated, um, but it, it does speak to that uh, need. Um, we're, we're talking as, as the Affordable Housing Committee is talking mm -hmm. about potentially trying to get an updated um, study done. Um, I believe that one was probably done as part of the comprehensive plan, so this might be a good okay. opportunity right. to do something like that. Jim Marie. Um, I, I know I'm going to be bringing, dragging you back a bit, but the QAP, the change to the QAP, could you refresh? my memory on, was that a change because of elderly or change because of family? Um, and because the audience also doesn't understand that there's a change in that formula, it also is driving some of the, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was the, like what more specifically yeah. the change they made? Yeah. Well, they made a lot of changes. Um, the one that, that specifically triggered this is that they created they created a six-point category that incentivizes that incentivizes family size units. So they basically, you know, they basically said that 50% of your units need to be two bedroom or more. Um, and within that 50%, um, you know, you can you, to get all six of those points. I think it's 20% of those have to be three bedroom or, or larger. Okay. And so that was the specific category they created that triggered this. And then we looked at that. Um, we looked at that um, that w that weighting of those points in comparison to how that would affect the points that we could still feel we could compete for in the cost per unit category, and we felt that that we needed to do that in order to keep this project equally competitive as it was last year and not lose ground. Uh, as, as a follow up, um, so the points for elderly. Got reduced. Is that correct? Or correct. Okay. The um, the the points for well, the points for family got reduced, and I don't know. I don't know if the points for elderly. Were I can't. Reduced. I I, 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 I think it was three to one. They went from three to one. They went from three to one. Yeah. 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 But not for elderly. We've not for elderly. For it was uh, just for uh, housing only. Yeah. Overall. For well, for uh, for in, right here. For in Scarborough for yeah, it's just housing overall. Senior, uh, it's still a five-point category <coughs> for senior, which I think it was last year. And but it was in the family category that they dropped it from um, three to one. Yeah, because I remember Scar thinking Scar that I was surprised. We were surprised too. I was real surprised because as a real estate broker, I know that the availability of housing in town is terrible for as far as affordability. Yeah, and they have a real. I mean, they have a. You know, they have a, a formula they use to right. calculate that, and I, I know we discussed this with Tom. Um, it's a bit <coughs> hard to, get, yeah, to get yeah. into those numbers and really make sense of them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not completely sure I understand the data they use to do that, right. but but they they felt that, it, you know, in in what they do, it was accurate. Um, I don't know that we feel that that the need really reflects. The downgrading of Scarborough, which is one of the fastest growing towns in Maine. So, I don't, you know, without getting into that too far, yeah. um, you know, we tried to put, give some commentary back to them. We did give some specific commentary to, okay. to that to them in our comments um, that we submitted formally, and um, to, you know, to suggest that we didn't feel it was that was reflective of the need. And I'm sorry, I'm going to follow up on that. Um, and I know they were going to have some hearings, or because I, I was talking to a couple of people from the legislative delegation about this uh, situation when it first happened. Um, and um, there was some concern when, when I looked at this, because they just did the formula, but they I can't even get it out of my brain here. My brain's so tired with it. But, <laughs> but when they adjusted that formula, I was surprised by the fact that they'd be more willing to have family units 
come in? I mean, I guess I'm confused because I thought that the, the maybe the senior didn't change, but the family units did, and why would you score differently? And I know it has to do with this all. <coughs> no one understands the formula. I guess yeah. that was pretty clear to me that no one seems to understand the formula. So the formula that they're using to calculate those points. Right. Yeah. They um they take as a, as a start, as a start, they take all the service center communities in Maine and they look at them on equal ground. Yeah. And then my understanding is what they do from there is is something akin to they look at the um, they look at the number of affordable units in that town, and then they look at the census data that suggests how many um, how many people are in are in the income band, right. and and they so they have a metric that that suggests that of those service center communities that you know there's X number of affordable units, there's X number of people in that income band, mm -hmm. and they look at all those together, and that that there's a ratio there that suggests mm -hmm. that some towns may have more of a need than the others. But the the thing that doesn't make sense to us is I don't know that they take into account population. Right. So it's almost like you know, on a per capita basis, right. there may be more needs here than in, yeah. you know, a town farther north, but they have to also be careful that they don't push all development down south. Right. So they, there's some politics involved on there and they have to be careful. Okay, <coughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and it came back to me what I was, <laughs> where, I, where I was going with that, and that is, it was also some underlying assumptions, and I could be incorrect with that, and it could have come out in whatever the hearings were, that um, groups like Avesta, wouldn't get as many points as some other people come in because they don't want to be given too much money. I mean, that was the way it was explained. <coughs> and I'm like, what? But anyway, I didn't well, know if that's an impact thing or. I mean, I, I, we we sort of take this on balance with with how it scores in the aggregate. We we still do think that it, it's a really strong scoring oh, application. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's not helpful that we lose those two points because of a, a change in the. The, their their rate ranking of Scarborough as a service center community, yep. but um, you know we're trying to we're trying to do everything we can, yep. including this change to pick up some of these family points. So, okay. thank you, uh, Jay. Can you speak to uh, what the planning department review and planning board review is vis-a-vis -vis parking, traffic, et cetera? How how it would change at all with this change in the composition of the beds? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we really need to drill into the details on it, but um, <coughs> for an example, one of the things when this project was originally approved, was originally approved, um, the, the number of units and the makeup of units, those original 50 units, would have required some 76 or 78 parking spaces. I don't remember what the number was. Um, Avesta made a case to the plan board based on all their analysis of the units they have across the state about how many cars people have in their, um, in their, in their unit types and basically were able to um, demonstrate to the planning board satisfaction that 55 spaces would satisfy their needs. So I think what we would look for, the, uh, for Avesta to do would be to run those numbers again based on this new makeup and mix of units and we can see where that fits and falls. I actually did a rough calculation, and it looks like based on the, re even though the unit <coughs> types have increased in bedrooms, obviously the overall number of units has reduced, that this mix of units would require 67 parking spaces. But what type of, how many vehicles are associated with a two and three bedroom unit as opposed to a, you know, more studios, that's the type of analysis we would look for Avesta to provide us to see if this needs to go back to the planning board for a site plan amendment or if, it's, if the numbers are still where they should be. The other item would be the traffic counts as well, I think that was brought up earlier, is what type of impacts and how many trips are generated based on a a studio as opposed to a three bedroom. And again, based on that mix, so we would, um, that's what Seth and I were talking beforehand, we'd look to them to provide us, you know, their traffic engineer to basically go back through the right. calculation and uh, procedure he went through before. And Did you that. say 76 originally? It was actually 78. 78. With, with the original 50, 50 in that mix, 
with the new mix, 38 units, with the new proposed mix, it would require 67 parking spaces. So it dropped? It dropped, okay. yep. Will? Uh, a couple questions. Uh, so you were saying that it might not need to go back to the board anymore. This could be an administrative review change? P potentially. We need, we need to take a look at those details, but yet, again, um, yes. That's okay. Yeah. And then the other question, last year we lost a lot of points for a missing sidewalk. Have we updated oh. the plan to include? We will. We, we will. Um, we will update the plan to include that, and, and, and we'll, we'll be clear this year on, on however we present that to Maine Housing to make sure that, that they're comfortable with how that's presented to them. Gotcha. Good. And then a uh, couple more questions. Um, do, you, do you have an idea of the timeline? When does the plan get submitted to Maine Housing, and when do they do the scoring? Uh, the, the due date this year is October 28th, so the applications will be submitted October 28th, and um, it's a little later than it has been in recent years, mm -hmm. so we usually find out before the end of the year. We usually find out ar around Thanksgiving, so I would, I would anticipate that we would hear before, still hear before the end of the year about, about which projects get awards. Great. And then my last question was, uh, we lost this point for us, two points for Scarborough as a, as a service center. Um, you mentioned something about, or I believe I heard you mention something about senior housing. Though, did we did we designate some of these units to be restricted for senior use, or is it just the makeup that suggests that there be more seniors that could live there? No. Um, so th these would these would be non-age restricted units. We would not I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can make a, have sort of a hybrid property and have some designated as age restricted and some not. As far as I know an interesting thing to look into, but um, suffice it to say, it, it's, e it's either age-restricted or non-age-restricted, and um, again, the age-restricted, some of the nuances of the main housing stuff, um, we, don't, we don't feel that the, that the age-restricted is as competitive <coughs> as, the, as a family property. This is, again, part of the reasoning why we we uh, took this approach on this one as family housing. Sure. Chris? Thank you. Chris? So um, it, it sounds kind of like deja vu all over again. There's a complicated formula from the state, and Scarborough is getting penalized for it, and nobody understands why. So um, I guess my question would be, is there something that we can do between now and October as a body or as individuals to lobby for this project, or is there something we can be doing to help support this, or are we better off just kind of sitting back and letting the formula work itself out and hope for the best? Well. Um, we did, we did, um, in terms of the, we did sort of lo lobby and provide comments in advance of the deadline for formal comments for this year's QAP. And um, they didn't, as far as I know, they didn't make any change. They didn't, in response to our comments, you know, this, we've, I guess we've seen this happen, sort of towns kind of bump up, bump down. Sometimes they bump up completely off the list. And um, it's, it's been a source of consternation to other developers over the years, so this is not anything that I think is, you know, in any way, you know, Scarborough should feel that they're, you know, that they're unduly or unfairly targeted here or anything like that. It does happen. It sort of a, yeah. has something to do with their. We were singled out. I mean, there were yeah, other towns, were dozens of other communities that were similarly affected by this one policy change. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that the Housing Alliance is now aware of the QAP. I think. Some of us knew the acronym, didn't really know what it was or how it might uh, impact us. So I suspect the alliance will continue to pay closer attention on, a, on an annual basis to see are there changes that that are potentially worrisome to us. Sean? Um, this, this is more um, related to the project or not. What was the TIF amount that we approved in the term? I'm just trying to remember the project. I know it's, it's been a year. It was a, it was a 50% TIF and the duration was... Um, was it 20, 20 years or 22 years? years. 20, yeah, I think it's for 22. I think it was 22. Yeah, I remember the odd number. Yeah, and a couple of years to make it. The and it's, a, it's a hybrid tip in that it's a specialized, yeah. right, it's an affordable housing tip, so it's not a, yeah. a conventional economic development tip, right. if you will. Right. Um, the other question I had, and I think I asked this before too, the number of um, units um, for the permits, is this outside of our GMO guidelines for permitting for a development? So. If we're already mat, uh, is it taken away from the, whatever the maximum total of permits that we give for development? So apartment units or these type of developments count differently than single families. Okay. And at this point, I don't, I haven't heard that we're sort of 
that this would push us over the edge or no I, I just, yeah I just um, I couldn't remember yeah. how it was they, 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 do, they are units. they do count um, they count differently there's count no exclusion differently. because they're affordable is that what you were asking no, I was just wanted to know, um, you know, does that put us over? I don't think we're going to number of permits that are allowed. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I couldn't remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Seth. Appreciate yeah, your yeah, question. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll momentarily adjourn and commence as soon as people are ready. Okay.